Among the nation's unsolved problems of 1967 was the ever-increasing flow of American dollars abroad. The balance of payments deficit could easily reach $4 billion. The president, during the final days of December, called a meeting of the men most familiar with the complex problem, men to whom he could look closest and hardest for solutions. Leading the contingent was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, William McChesney Martin, followed by Secretary of the Treasury Fowler, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Secretary of Commerce Trowbridge. The budget director, Charles Schultz, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Wilbur Mills. Majority Whip Hale Boggs, who chairs the Foreign Economic Policy Committee. And finally, Senator Long of Louisiana, member of many Senate and Joint Committees central to the control of the nation's fiscal policy. To an outsider, they appear to be no more than relaxed executives taking a lunch break in the company cafeteria. But in actuality, they were helping the president put the final stamp on a program of action that would, in the year ahead, bring the elusive balance of payments close to equilibrium. The final decisions agreed upon the last day of December were put before the public on the following morning in President Johnson's 116th news conference. That same day, he also released a major statement on the balance of payments from San Antonio, thus underscoring his concern by taking the case directly to the people. As vital and far-reaching as these fiscal decisions were, they remained only one aspect of the total program President Johnson had been elected to manage, the United States of America. And it was time once again to take this total picture of the nation put it in full perspective, and give the American people a realistic appraisal of the State of the Union. No presidential task demands more time and more personal attention than the preparation of the State of the Union message and its companion, the annual budget message. For President Johnson, work on this project began nine months earlier. And now, with the address barely two weeks away, the main thrust of his attention, wherever he went, whatever he did, was centered upon the statement he would soon make to Congress and the American people. Still, in the midst of his accelerated schedule, he found time to personally present the Minuteman flag to the 12th Air Force at Bergstrom. This Patriot's emblem is awarded to organizations with more than 90% participation in annual savings bond drives. At a time when not only America's will was being tested, but the soundness of the dollar, these men in uniform backed their nation with both battlefield courage and the payroll envelope. On the 7th of January, some very chilly citizens of San Antonio gathered at Randolph Air Force Base to help President Johnson welcome Prime Minister Eshkol of Israel. Taking advantage of his visit to the United States, President Johnson invited the Prime Minister and Mrs. Eshkol to be his guest at the Texas White House.
The quick flight to the LBJ ranch gave Mrs. Eshkol and the Prime Minister a chance to see some rugged land, not unlike their own. Harsh at times, but giving satisfaction to those who work to give it life. This great land of Texas, it reminds me very much of parts of my own country, although there is, of course, no comparison in size. I can see here the results of pioneering and dedication, the beauty men can create when they are free. Both men shared visions and a national purpose far brighter than their abilities to make deserts bloom. This past year has been a very busy one for the American peacemakers in the Middle East, in Cyprus, in Vietnam, and many places around the world. And wherever conscience and faith have carried them, they have found a stubborn truth confirmed. Making peace is punishing work. With the departure of the Prime Minister, long-needed rains drenched the land, giving promise of a good spring. The President would remain at the ranch throughout the first two weeks of January. He would continue to concentrate on the substantive portions of the message, such as budget outlays, programs, international progress. At the same time, he would reflect upon the nation's mood. There was in the country a growing restlessness. Although more was being done for the people than at any time in America's history, questioning voices were being heard. This too was part of the State of the Union and must be part of the message, perhaps at the core of it. It was time to return to Washington. It was the 15th of January. In two days, the president would deliver the message. Until the very moment he stepped into the house chamber, he would continue to double check the endless facts and figures, personally write and rewrite the carefully constructed passages until the precise meaning was unmistakably clear. It would take him less than one hour to deliver the address, but its preparation had taken almost a year. The State of the Union message is far more than a speech. Beyond the pages of typing, beyond the hundreds of yards of teleprompter copy, lies a presidential program, a target for the nation to aim for, a series of human goals, each designed to make life better for everyone. And in so doing, strengthen the nation, strengthen the world community. The anatomy of the message is as big and sprawling and complex as the whole field of human relationships. Foreign policy, great chunks of it, from anticipation of a draft treaty halting the spread of nuclear weapons, to an exploration of a recent statement from Hanoi. A slight change in wording speaks volumes in the language of the diplomat. As all consuming the war in Vietnam appeared to be, there were challenges at home of equal intensity. The city riots of 1967 were still fresh in the minds of everyone. No matter how the analysts explained it, there remained the hard, cold fact that a wide gulf separated many Americans from the promise their society offered. The president's message must offer more than a promise. It must provide for realistic measures, expanded job opportunities for the hardcore unemployed, housing for their families, a rebuilding of congested, dying cities. Income for farm workers lagged far behind the national average. There was unfinished legislative work in the consumer field, 
And President Johnson was all too conscious of the fact that America lagged far behind the rest of the world in saving the lives of infants. Among children, crippling defects were often discovered too late for corrective action. The president's program took shape. It was challenged, defended, argued over, but always, overall, improved. Often aspirations were tempered by the dollar. The budget was a tough factor, setting limits and restrictions. Yet there could be no price tag put on freedom. The war was costly, but requirements at home were also urgent. Something had to give. Priorities must be established, difficult choices made. The art and manner of the delivery itself had to be considered. Television places the speaker virtually on a conversational basis with everyone in the country. On the 17th of January, the day the address was scheduled, the president briefed his cabinet on the final form and substance of his message. At the same time, he took satisfaction in Vice President Humphrey's report on his recent trip to Africa. The vice president told of the spirit of regional cooperation that was beginning to take hold. The president then briefed the democratic leadership. Questions were raised regarding both the addition and the omission of specific programs. Again, the question of priorities determined just how much the country could do. The president's program had gone to the heart of what America is all about. His proposals were not partisan ones. They were goals for both Democrats and Republicans. And in that spirit, President Johnson called in the Republican leadership and personally briefed them on his message. Senate Republican leader Everett Dirksen had been hospitalized, but the GOP was ably represented by minority leader Representative Gerald Ford. Following a particularly fruitful and friendly discussion, the president stopped to admire the congressman's tie class. Not to be outdone, he showed off his own class with the gold initials LBJ. He told the GOP leader that he could have it, providing he wore it to work. Then he was back to business, for his message was scheduled for broadcast in a matter of hours. Although he would continue to change a phrase here, a word there, right up to the moment of delivery, for all practical purposes, the message was complete. His proposals locked in. All that remained now was getting advanced copies to the press. I have come once again to this chamber, the home of our democracy, to give you, as the Constitution requires, information of the State of the Union. I report to you that our country is challenged at home and abroad, that it is our will that is being tried and not our strength. 
our sense of purpose and not our ability to achieve a better America. That we have the strength to meet our every challenge, the physical strength to hold the course of decency and compassion at home, and the moral strength to support the cause of peace in the world. The president concentrated the opening of his address on the uppermost concern of the nation, the chances for peace. I have just recently returned from a very fruitful visit and talks with His Holiness the Pope. And I share his hope, as he expressed it earlier today, that both sides will extend themselves in an effort to bring an end to the war in Vietnam. And I have today assured him that we and our allies will do our full part to bring this about. Continuing on the international scene, the president summed up events throughout the year that have been milestones toward attaining world peace. Toward the goal of international cooperation. As you will remember, I met with Chairman Kosygin in Glassboro, and we achieved, if not accord, at least a clearer understanding of our respective positions after two days of meeting. Because we believe that the nuclear danger must be narrowed, we have worked with the Soviet Union and with other nations to reach an agreement that will halt the spread of nuclear weapons. As an historic footnote to the president's remarks, at 4.25 a.m. the following morning, the White House would be informed that the Soviet Union would join the United States as co-chairman of the 18-nation disarmament committee and would that very day submit a complete text of a treaty to Geneva to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. Now let me speak uh, now about some matters here at home. Tonight, our nation is accomplishing more for its people than has ever been... The president spoke of the unprecedented prosperity in the country, American but recognized, too, the restlessness, the questioning. And while we have accomplished, accomplished much, much remains for us to meet, and much remains for us to master. In some areas, the jobless rate is still three or four times the national average. Violence has shown its face in some of our cities. Crime increases on our streets. Income for farm workers remains... The country for many years had accepted these conditions as inevitable. But now it was time for change. To produce our food programs for by the Congress. He spoke of the Americans who were left behind and of what must be done to bring them into the mainstream. And this year, the time has come when we must get to those who are last in line, the hardcore unemployed, the hardest to reach. Employment officials estimate that 500,000 of these persons are now unemployed in the major cities of America. And our objective is to place these 500,000 in private industry jobs within the next three years. <laughs> to do this, I propose a $2 billion, $100 million manpower program in the coming fiscal year, a 25% increase over the current year. Most of this increase will be used to start a new partnership between government and private industry to train and to hire the hardcore unemployed persons. I know of no task before us of more importance to us and to the country or to our future. The president spoke comprehensively of the challenges Americans faced at home. 
he sought help for the cities, a strengthening of health and education programs, an advancement of the consumer's cause, support for law enforcement agencies at every level of government. He asked for a checking of inflation and the erosion of the dollar by prompt enactment of the tax increase. And to resist them decisively. Several of these goals are going to be very hard to reach. But the state of our union will be much stronger eight years from now on our 200th birthday if we resolve to reach these goals now. And they are more important, much more important, than the identity of the party or the president who will then be in office. These goals are what the fighting and our alliances are really meant to protect. Can we achieve these goals? Of course we can, if we will. If, there, if ever there was a people who sought more than mere abundance, it is our people. If ever there was a nation that was capable of solving its problems, it is this nation. If ever there were a time to know the pride and the excitement and the hope of being an American, it is this time. So this, my friends, is the state of our union. Seeking, building, tested many times this past year and always equal to the test. Thank you and good night. And then, the reaction. Journalists, commentators, economists would all have their say, analyzing, dissecting, reading between the lines, measuring the impact of the president's words upon every phase of American life. But whether his supporters praised it or the opposition criticized it, a new plan had been laid before the American people, and a new legislative year had begun. Whether the plan would be built upon would depend both upon the will of the people and the president's follow-up work in translating proposals into programs of action for those he sought to help. It was time now to press ahead with the first of that follow-up work. He called in the Democratic members of the House and Senate Labor Committee passing out copies of his first special message of the year to Congress. The right of every American to earn a living. In plain language, the president stressed the need for government to work in partnership with private industry in training and in putting to work the nation's forgotten men and women, the hardcore unemployed. Leo Beebe, vice president of Ford Motor Company, told how a national alliance of businessmen would help turn a half million unemployables in 50 of the nation's largest cities into productive wage earners. 
As the president personally spearheaded this effort to bring jobs to the big city ghettos, Mrs. Johnson used her influence with the women of America to get private citizens behind one of the most pressing bills tied up in Congress. The existence of crime and the fear of it have eroded the quality of our lives. Commissions have been named to inquire into the cause, but in the end, the success of freeing our neighborhoods from hoodlums and fear depends upon the cooperation of all our citizens. There must be an attempt to involve the citizens of the low-income, high-crime communities in their own crime prevention programs. We decided that we would start with such simple things as getting one dropout back in school, helping one child released from a correctional institution. Ms. Johnson, you have the doers of America here at the White House today. The women of America can increase the safety of our streets, control the sale of firearms and these mail-order murders, restore respect for our law enforcement officers. But we must involve ourselves, commit ourselves as individual citizens and then move decisively. I urge that you follow this pattern. It was Mrs. Johnson's first doer's luncheon. Nearly 50 women leaders gathered at the White House to discuss practical, positive methods for combating crime. Suddenly, the discussion was interrupted by a fiery charge from singer Eartha Kitt, who claimed that crime in the ghetto stemmed from the war in Vietnam. The singer was ably answered by Mrs. Johnson, who replied, because there is a war on, that still doesn't give us a free ticket not to work for better things, for better education and better health for our people, and against crime in the streets. Within a few days, 56 major national organizations from all over the country would respond to the First Lady's efforts to involve the citizenry in an all-out attack on crime, many of them patterning their local programs along the guidelines set forth in Mrs. Johnson's first doer's luncheon. On January 19th, President Johnson received credentials from five newly appointed ambassadors. Receiving credentials was more symbol than substance, but underlying this time-honored ceremony was America's commitment against want and ignorance, against tyranny and famine. There were many signs during the past year that spoke well for a more stable world community, and President Johnson welcomed any chance to enumerate them. The Kennedy Round, the greatest reduction in tariff barriers in all the history of trade negotiations. The nations of Latin America were moving toward economic integration. Many Asian nations were working behind America's shield to strengthen their economies. Africa was seeing the beginnings of regional cooperation. But trouble on many fronts persisted. The latest and perhaps most potentially dangerous, North Korea. Over the past 15 months was seen a stepped up campaign of violence against South Korea and the American troops in the DMZ. Armed raider teams were sent into South Korea to sabotage and to assassinate. And on this very day, January 19th, a 31 man team of North Korean raiders invaded Seoul. Although it failed, their mission was to murder the president of the Republic of Korea. The president first received word slightly after two in the morning, January 23rd. Within hours, morning newspapers would carry the headlines that would stun and then deeply anger Americans across the country. This week, the North Koreans committed yet another wanton and aggressive act by seizing an American ship and its crew in international waters. In the fish room of the White House, the president and his senior advisors briefed bipartisan members of the Foreign Affairs and Appropriations Committees. 
the congressional leaders were informed that an immediate protest had been made to North Korea at Panmunjom. But the response had been both cynical and a distortion of the facts. The National Security Council explored the various alternatives open to the administration. One thing was certain. As the President and the Secretary of State agreed, the situation of the captured ship USS Pueblo, as grave as it was, must be handled with restraint. In the balance for the lives of 83 Navy men, as well as the ever-present threat of widening the conflict in Asia. By the 25th of January, after extensive consultation with his senior advisors, President Johnson instructed Ambassador Arthur Goldberg to request an urgent meeting of the United Nations Security Council. In the Situation Room of the White House, linked by cable to the capitals of the world, the President continued to use every means available to find a prompt and peaceful solution to the problem. But at the same time he made use of the diplomatic channels, he clearly saw the need for certain precautionary measures. The military forces must be prepared for any contingency that might arise. The nuclear carrier Enterprise slipped her berth at Sasebo, Japan, and headed northward to the waters off South Korea. For the first time since the 1962 call-up, 28 units of the Airborne Reserves were called back to active duty. Whatever reasons lay behind the North Korean gambit, it was clear that one aim was to divert American and South Korean military resources being presently employed in Vietnam. By strengthening America's ready air arm, the President denied them this objective. On January 25th, the White House tradition was observed with pride and elegance. The annual dinner honoring the three branches of government. Representing the legislative, Speaker of the House John W. McCormick, accompanied by Mrs. McCormick. The executive, Vice President Humphrey and Mrs. Humphrey. And the judicial, Chief Justice Earl Warren and Mrs. Warren. The president emphasized that these three leaders, in their separate roles, bearing diverse responsibilities, have made the good of the people their single concern. As January drew to a close, the contrast became ever sharper between the president the public saw only on the sports pages or presiding over stately East Room ceremonies and the other president, a hard-working man whose daily world is a series of tough, realistic battles over unpassed legislation, hard budget choices, and a thousand arguments and compromises that, out of political necessity, lie behind all bills, programs, proposals, and presidential decisions. On January 29th, many of these difficult choices and arguments finally wound up between the covers of the most important document in government, the instrument that makes everything else possible, the annual budget. Behind these figures, hidden in these tables, lie the dreams and the hopes of the American people, 200 million of them. Just for example, take a line that says the Teachers Corps, or the Peace Corps, or VESTA. And then think of all the gallant, eager young people whose dream of service to their country will be fulfilled by these cold numbers. Think of the millions of people they serve. Think, if you will, of the millions of dollars that they save and the lives they redeem and the doors of opportunity they open and the freedom and liberty that they protect and advance. After he put his pen to the $186 billion plan for the new year, the president presided over the swearing-in of Charles Zwick, his new director of the budget. 
To Zwick would fall the difficult job of putting an objective, realistic price tag on each of America's aspirations. The administration had known for some time that the communists had planned a winter spring offensive. In the final hours of January, their main thrust took shape. In a coordinated attack across the length and breadth of Vietnam, the communists swarmed through 38 major cities. And in one desperate suicide assault, 19 Viet Cong commandos stormed the United States Embassy in Saigon. The week of January 1968 would rank as one of the most crisis-ridden of the Johnson presidency. Since the Pueblo incident, the president kept clear, open lines of communication with congressional leaders, briefing them personally with increasing frequency. During the week, he spoke in person to at least 100 senators and representatives whose congressional assignments were central to the control of appropriations, armed forces, and foreign affairs. As the president and his advisors briefed the congressman, one fact became undeniably clear. The nation was being tested as never before. But it was not her strength that was being tried. It was her will, not her ability, but her sense of purpose. I believe with abiding conviction that this people, nurtured by their deep faith, tutored by their hard lessons, moved by their high aspirations, have the will to meet the trials that these times impose.